Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Shona Lee. And I'm Heather Voiles. And we're here today to talk to you about the problem of finding apps, uh, which was described on one website when I uh, went looking, using the search terms, why is it so hard to find apps? Uh, one of the mobile websites described this problem as finding a needle in a stack of needles. So the problem isn't that they aren't out there, it's that there's an overabundance of them. We set out looking at this problem from the perspective of what we perceive to be seekers. So we imagined at the beginning people who said, "Who? I have a problem, there's probably an app to solve that problem, how am I going to go out and find this app? And so we set up a, a questionnaire and um, asked questions about how people find them and what their experience was. And as we looked at the data, we found that there weren't just seekers, but there were also discoverers and they had sort of distinctly different ways of thinking about it. And people sort of appear on a continuum here. The seekers are actively looking for solutions for problems and they have, uh, re they have issues with the search process. So they like to try things first um, and they find the, seat, the search process frustrating because there's too many to choose from and there's poor search features. And one of the big problems is that there's so many review sites where the reviews are biased or purchased. Um, and they have different set of problems from the ones that we call discoverers. The discoverers are also using the reviews and recommendations, but they're tending to just pick things up as they happen upon them rather than actively going out looking for a solution to something. So my first assessment was that the discoverers don't actually have this problem, but I said it to AJ, and AJ said to me, it's not that I don't have this problem, it's that I've given up solving it. So the personal experience of the problem is different for the discoverers and the seekers, but the discoverers aren't satisfied necessarily with the outcome of the situation. So our problem statement results in um, people needing to be able to search for apps by describing the problem they're experiencing within some sort of search function rather than having to use the same words that developers use, developers use to describe their solutions. So basically common language search. Yeah, so we just sort of have it summed up as problem-based rather than solution-based searching yeah. as, as the problem statement. Does anyone have any questions? Haystack, that's Haystack. a great name. It's probably taken, that but that's a great hackathon. name. We use that at our hackathon. Oh, yeah. Carol's and hackathon. And, you and we already have, have the graphics. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> okay. Half of the problem is Pick the name, Yay. that's the hard part. All right, now we just have to build it. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> any questions? Yeah, I guess. So you, you said that you were talking about frustrations. Could you? Are there any specific examples? Um, I'm trying to remember, but it, that was pulled out of several of the responses because mm -hmm. we had free form responses in the questionnaire yep. um, and the word frustrating came up repeatedly, okay. but people were talking about not being able to tell what the features were, not being able to tell whether the reviews were valid or whether they were AstroTurf um, and just not being able to trust, but also particularly that neither of the app, big app stores has a good search function. Um, the iStore searches on keywords, but not on descriptions. And the interesting thing is the metadata is available for the description, so you can build on top of that, but they don't use it in their search function. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's that there's this overabundance okay. of apps. Um, also, apologies, uh, I didn't hmm? this your actual survey. Um, was it open and closed ended questions? Yeah, it was only three questions. Yeah. Okay. It was yeah. very short. So you had what one open ended and two closed ended questions? And there was a pot a place for people to put other and comments okay. in the in the closed ones. Did you so. find the other section gave you a lot of useful information? Um it gave me a couple of surprising things. Like a couple of people said I just don't I don't I like I don't like apps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the person who said they didn't like apps also talked about their own phone. So they were somebody who was really focused on getting somebody else to find a solution and then using whatever their friend used. Okay. So they just didn't, they didn't bother with the search, uh, search at all. And 
several people talked about really relying on recommendations. Yeah, um, and a few people that I spoke to um, uh, the day before yesterday had, had mirrored some of the things that Carol had said this morning, which is just because you go looking for, uh, if you have a problem and you go looking for an app to solve it, and you don't get the response, you just you don't necessarily make the assumption that the app doesn't exist, it's just that you can't find it. So you don't know what's out there yeah. because you haven't stumbled upon it yet. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a problem for everyone because they don't know if yeah. that app is even, you know, even out there. Mm -hmm. So I think when that's what piqued my interest about this potential problem when Gavin was talking about it, it was more like not so much about is there an app for that, but is there a place where you can go and search for a problem to see if there's yeah. any number of solutions, whether that's an app or something else? Are there any competitors out there doing that now that you found? Well, Google does the app search. Well, the app store. There's, yeah. yes. No, there's an there's actual apps, app oh. search, like yeah, images and apps. Pick, you can just search you can apps, apps through Google, okay. not okay. through Play or through um, iTunes. And there's uh, there were several app apps Mm -hmm. So you could go and download an app and it would make app recommendations, but that's explicitly against the terms of service of the app store. So mm -hmm. sometimes they get away with it for a period of time and then they get pulled. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but most of the app review sites are actually primarily there as a promotion tool for the app developers mm -hmm. rather than really as, which is where people mm -hmm. talk about the astroturfing and not being able to trust mm -hmm. the reviews. And what I found looking at the review sites was they tend to be in order by release, and they're not categorized very well. It's and it's it's not this problem search. It's like, um, it's it's you have to know what category you're looking for right. first. So you have to go looking for something more specific than I'm frustrated with such and such a problem that I'm having. Like you can't just put you know there's not a, a bit of like a some sort of uh, database that you can access that says you know. My problem is I've lost my car keys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we and were talking about nat natural apps, language. Yeah, yeah, natural language, being yeah. able to search that way, and then a, a number of solutions yeah. that are curated by s an authority on app use or the app functionality. It's all just sort of like something's being spit back out to you based on release dates or based on marketing material or based on what the mm -hmm. developer wants to push out there. Yeah. But it's not necessarily just providing a list of things that you can that you can experience yeah, or it's not experiment really with. Yeah, and there's not a lot of smart filtering, and it's not very simple. It's just a very crowded and uh, noisy uh, noisy space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This was yours, right? Good job. Jane, do you want to pick your last one? You're on. Hi. So I'm Faye McDonald, and my problem. I had an initial hypothesis. Generally, I wanted to figure out why people weren't being more active or how they evaluated their own physical activity. And I had my own hypothesis that financial concerns were preventing a lot of physical activity. So I came up with, well, Colin and I came up with six questions and we went to interview people to see if they would. So I came up with six questions to see more like how people felt about their physical activity and what excuses that they would tell me why they weren't being active. And then I realized through discovery interviews that I did through both Snapchat and Facebook that time was more of a prevalent excuse and theme in, in, <coughs> in activity, and which actually worked to my benefit because it's easier to kind of communicate time with people because it's a more standard metric. Like we all have 24 hours in the day and Facebook interviews the same response I got from those. So also to save time in the interview process, Colin and I had the idea to use Snapchat to limit the interviews to 10 seconds because I know through here like time is valuable and it's easy to get off track and go off in different directions. And it wasn't the greatest effort but I do did like the idea because I did like I just had a fun time making a movie and You're not showing me. and yeah it's fun. I've turned it into a movie okay. so I'll show you guys. But I don't know if it will have sound. You respond by the camera? No, I have to Question. Limited. I enjoy walking and skiing and sailing and golf. Skiing in the winter, running when there's no snow on the ground, basketball whenever I want, and the gym six days a week. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Snapchat's a great bro. Uh, diminished. Dress. 
drastically. <laughs> Did it go <laughs> down? So Taurus. Uh, over the years, in my 30s, it went in the toilet because uh, I had no time. I was traveling all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Doing more than 30 minutes a day. Getting back into running and doing more sit-ups and plyometrics again. 30 days cardio. Oh. Do my Michaels? Yeah. School. Time, weather, motivation. Getting to the gym by 5 a.m. prevents me from being bored. to interrupt people during the questions. I know, and like I had, so I had in my mind, it's money, but no one said money as an excuse, so I was like, oh, okay, I learned something. And then I went through Facebook, and I reached out to about 35 friends today, and I had about 20 of them got back to me, and the same thing, it was all about like freedom and flexibility, and everyone did like a small challenge, so the idea is, the problem, in my opinion, is we need to be more active and encouraging. So to develop an app where you're sharing and being more active and listening to people is a skill that you have to kind of work hard on using the feedback. And so my, through the discovery interviews, I pivoted to now the issue is gonna be time to communicate to people or come up with an effective way to overcome the bar- time, or the supposed time barriers of physical activity, and that is my conclusion. Right. Yeah, that's 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 great. Great. So it was pretty. Do those interviews because the first you stood up and introduced yourself to begin with that you wanted to be a talk show host, and I'm like, there's it. There's one. No. Snapchat oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I had a like I actually surprised myself how excited I was doing that. It was fun. Snapchat's a real unorthodox uh, avenue to take for, uh, for doing your marketing. A lot more people are doing it yeah. these days. Yeah. And it's more, it's really interactive, and I think that there's an avenue there to like connect more with people because you have your facial expressions and. Yeah. That's like a big deal. So I I'm excited. So wait, you just took the video of the video that you did. Yeah, so that was that the idea to do that was to limit each answer to ten seconds. So that with the six questions it was just a one minute interview. And then I sent it to my story and Snapchat deletes when you send it to a friend, but when you send a, a segment to your story, it stays on your story for 24 hours. So then you have the option to save from there. So I went, I did this like 10 second, 10 second for each question, and then saved it and then uploaded it to my phone and kind of like mishmashed it. So I did one person at a time, but then I, the questions that I asked them, I put them on the slide through iMovie and then did one after the other to do it like that. So it was like, I had a lot of fun doing that. It was fun. (laughs) Somebody left their mouse there, right? You're on, and we can barely see you. Really? I don't want to, like, block the... No, well, don't you stand over by you. Want to. Hurry. 
Stand in front of me. You're yeah, there. Sure yeah. Hi. <laughs> we are the totem pole that is AJ Fraser. <laughs> this is really awkward. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily McLeod. Um, and we're going. Do you want to introduce yourself? You started it. Okay, never mind. Let's start over. Can we start over? Yes. Take two. Take Hi, everybody. Two. Uh, my name is AJ Fraser. And my name is Emily McLeod. And we're going to talk to you a bit about our project this week that we have been working on. So a problem that we outlined was that the current solutions offered to keep loved ones um, who live in other regions connected aren't effective enough. So um, this was something that we all noticed, that we, we have loved ones kind of all over Canada and the States and Europe and that sort of thing, and uh, it's, it's been an issue uh, keeping in contact with them the way that we would like to. And I think we're all pretty tech-savvy people, so you would assume that a better solution would be out there. Um, we worked on... Um, four methods of that validation, only completing two of them. So um, when uh, Brian was here the other day too, all three of us, we looked at uh, a survey to do a uh, quantitative uh, research method, a qualitative uh, individual interviews, a focus group to kind of gather some discussion because you never know. Um, other people sometimes weed out some answers from people, but we haven't had the time for that. And then uh, eventually getting to a point where we uh, actually build an offered solution uh, and a web page with a bunch of buttons, and then just try and drive traffic to that and let people click, and it'll just be a bunch of broken links. So um, to see if any of these solutions uh, would work out. Uh, so we did the two of them. Um, I'm going to handle the survey part of it. So uh, on SurveyMonkey, we made a survey, and um, a couple of things came out. So given the choice of uh, fathers and mothers, spouses, uh, sisters, brothers, uh, we noticed that a lot of people identified uh, friends as people that they to keep in contact with, um, that majority of the time, 68% of people uh, contact them by phone and text, 60% uh, for social media, and about 34% of people identified um, FaceTime, Skype, Google Hangouts as a, as a method that they use, and 87% of people said that it was effective. Um, so any one of these methods they feel are keeping them in contact, 13% um, said ineffective. Um, most of these Interactions are very short, so under 30 minutes. Um, and I'm assuming that's the Skype or that's the uh, the texting, putting up something on a Facebook wall. Um, so it's about 64%. But then there was some good quality time at about 30 to 60 minutes. And then the overwhelming majority uh, were looking for a better uh, solution. So I think it was like 87% or something um, were looking for for something better in the future. But that they did find what they had was you know it was effective for now. Um, and from the interviews, these are just some trends we noticed that a lot of people tended to miss the physicality of being close to somebody. So they reverted to using programs like Skype and FaceTime to try and recreate the physicality that they're missing in real time. Um, but a lot of people <coughs> actually stated that they like talking on the phone because there's something more intimate about using the phone to communicate. It's old fashioned, traditional. Um, and they stated that one of the reasons why they wanted to get in touch with somebody was because they missed them or had something important to say. Um, and they wanted to get in touch with close friends or family to, to talk about what, whatever was bothering them or um, problem at the time. And another interesting trend was that some of the, the individuals who were using technology wanted to teach older or younger people how to use a, a specific type of technology. So there was that element of learning there that was was kind of cool yeah i particularly uh, out of the interviews i found that that was the most interesting thing so that hurdle you assume that maybe uh, <coughs> older generation it would be a hurdle to to learn a new technology but the young people in my found uh, actually liked the process of teaching them how to use something new um so i just wanted to mention these were some of the comments that came out of the survey monkey of things that were people were hoping for in the future there's an overwhelming <laughs> trend towards teleportation and holograms <laughs> Fucking holograms, actually. Um, as well, <laughs> some people were hoping for a more secure way of sharing uh, content. Uh, that, so that was kind of a cool thing that came up. And then some people were actually hoping for uh, things like more affordable travel. Uh, so solving some of these real world issues to actually get in contact with people in real time. So uh, I think uh, if that didn't work for those people, then maybe a hologram would. Hologram. <laughs> hologram. 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 
There was <laughs> Tupac at like yeah. one of the like yes. Coachella or something. Yeah. So the the cool thing is, I think I think you know we are moving in that direction, especially with VR too. That I uh, just watched the F8 conference and um, the guy who did the whole talk on Oculus and the VR stuff. I think it's gonna be crazy. We're all gonna be sitting in this room. We're gonna be home in our underwear, sitting in UIT <laughs> with our little avatars talking to each other. So. Um, were there any results you guys weren't expecting that you got from uh, from the interview chicken surveys? Uh, there are a few people who said that they don't miss talking yeah. to friends or family, and I guess they when they're there, they're there. And when they're not, it's sort of like out of sight, out of mind, which is you know. Yep. Yeah, um, found that. Yeah, I don't know. There was there was some like other suggestions of like how people so people some people said that they did still like to communicate through email because mm -hmm. it's that sort of uh, long form letter it's the it's the newer version of an old-fashioned format yep. um, and then other people said I hate email because email gets lost amongst the uh, amongst all of the other emails you get through the day yeah um, but uh, yeah that was I mean s people are so into Facebook Twitter Instagram and snapchat right mm -hmm. now and texting like that's the, those are the two the yeah. two big ones, but I think uh, you're going to see more and more and more. I mean, this is that this is like personal projection, so don't mm -hmm. take this as uh, real data. But I think you're going to see more people moving towards that video conferencing, and, and as it becomes easier, it's as amazing. calls get dropped less, as the quality increases, as it becomes easier. If I can press a button yeah. and say a name and identify who I want to talk to, and they're right there in the room, I think that's mm -hmm. going to be good. Okay. Yeah. You're not the only one that has that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of people getting that. like yeah. email. So. It is the quickest way right now, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As long as you have somebody's number, send out a little text to them. So. Okay. All right. Good job, guys. <laughs> We're good to go now. All right. Hi. My name's Jake. I'm a music producer, uh, amateur app developer, and a hockey fan. And I'm Darren. I'm an ergonomist, ski bum, and craft beer enthusiast. We, along with 288 million other people around the world, are Twitter users, sharing an average of 500 million tweets per day. <laughs> Twitter is a rapid uh, stream of information. You follow my tweets, and I follow yours. Because of this mechanism, a duality exists. We have instantaneous access to the most relevant and irrelevant information all at the same time. So often we follow people based on a singular interest, yet most of us have many. Someone who follows me based on an interest in my music uh, might not care when I tweet about a new AngularJS tutorial. And those that follow me for UX design may not be interested in the latest Monday night race results from the ski hill. We created a survey and over 60% of those surveyed said they had deleted a tweet because they weren't comfortable sharing it with all their followers. The problem is there's an inherent fear that many of our tweets may cause us to lose followers or inadvertently offend someone. Uh, this is especially true for professionals because most of the people that follow us is a result of what we do, but we also have family and friends and other interests of our own. As a result, some of this information never gets shared. A person of diverging interests finds themselves on the sidelines of trending issues, events, music, news, whatever. And this results in a watered down version of ourselves. But what if it didn't have to be this way? Over the past few decades, information sharing has changed the world. And today, many businesses are set up to make sense of that information. But the most important opinions and interests are our own. And we'd like to help you organize them. Thank you. Can we get a copy of that? I'll put a beat to the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> Time stretch. There's Cadence. Start, um, start. What was it? Uh, auto tuning the. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> My name is Darren. Are your tweets? <laughs> really tough. Was there uh, any answers or outcomes unexpected from, from your survey? Um, um, not, so, not so much, I don't think. I think 
uh, most of it was in line with what we expected. Yeah. Um, and our survey was filled also with questions um, just about uh, how the people that were responding to the survey used Twitter, like mm -hmm. if they had multiple accounts or if they used yeah. it for a business or Yeah, or most of you, a lot um, of you filled this out too. Yeah, there's so many yeah. of the results there. So, yeah. Well, there, there's some good data, you know, a um, good chunk of people use it to log in yeah. um, to sites. A lot of people use it frequently throughout the day. You know, there's only about 13% don't use it on a daily basis. Yeah, and most of them only have one account. Yeah, so this this was, you know, over 60% only have one account. So it's not a problem for all Twitter users, but there is a good chunk of folks that it is an issue for. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and this is the one that we really kind of honed in on was there's less than 40% never deleted a tweet okay. so over 60 did so that's a it seems yeah. like it's an issue and then the real tell here is three people want to give us money for it today for a solution <laughs> and 15 people would love to be able to do this and there's only less than 30 percent were not interested in it so I was yeah, three. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 70 percent of people would like a solution to this challenge. Yeah. So. And we look and beyond the survey, we looked into other third party Twitter apps that exist. Yeah. We <laughs> looked into it and found out there's a million <laughs> Twitter third party apps. Yeah. Um, and seven hundred thousand developers. Yeah. Um, but yeah. none none of the apps that we went through did anything along these lines. Okay. Excellent. So, mm -hmm. I yeah. thought you meant there were that many that were doing that. No, 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 no. Just yeah. just in general. And that probably includes the sites that would just use it to log in, but yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. still, like, there's lots out there, and no one's really done this yet, so. Probably because it's really hard, because Twitter is a one-way broadcast, yeah. Yeah. and I think that's a challenge. It's not, yeah. it's not designed in, in the infrastructure. But it's definitely a problem people are having up there. Absolutely. But it's yeah, almost sure. like Snapchat, where you can select who you mm -hmm. send your chats to. Yeah, where right. Snaps to. Yeah, and Facebook has that option. Exactly. And Google. Yeah. Just and Google. if mm -hmm. we wanted to be ham fisted, we could just build a whole other like mirror app of Twitter on top of Twitter that just shares information you put into it to Twitter mm -hmm. and or like to your have it similar to like the apps like Periscope and Meerkat that whoever else has the app that follows you is like added on that mm -hmm. so that anybody else that would be using this app and sharing stuff with the interest could like see that with you. Yep. And then people that aren't only get just the stuff you're putting straight up to do your normal Twitter. Yep. Okay. There's lots of different ways around it. So. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Good job, guys. Good job. I am. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Carol Louie, and this is Darian McDonald, and we want to introduce you to push control uh, so that you don't have to be a pushover. Um, we found that the pain point was balance. Um, push notifications are a great way um, and have great potential to have a personalized conversation between mobile app users and companies. Um, it creates engagement that drives interest for a product or a business. But um, there are a ton of apps such as Parse, Game, Thive, and Pushover um, who have started assisting companies to be sending out more push notifications, and that's flooding us, the users, um, with information. Uh, so we can't keep up. Uh, so one of the stats that we got was that annoying push notifications are the number one reason why people delete an application on their phone. So our solution is to give the users more control. From our survey, we found that 0% have all the notifications enabled, two-thirds are constantly distracted by notifications from their phone, and that 90% wish there was a way to organize these notifications better. So some of their advice was to have organization filtered by the type of app, whether it's game or social, and by personal importance. Timing, to be able to select when they receive the messages and amount, to have a maximum number of, maximum number of notifications a single app can send and have a list instead of just, instead of a list, just give the number of notifications. So as far as competition, Pushover is an app that can create custom notifications that are pushed to your phone and hooks. It selects content you want from specific social media sites. Thank you. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? <laughs>
Um, if you guys wanted to see that stat, this is the top seven reasons why people uninstall a mobile app. Um, and yeah, Hook was really cool. I suggest looking at it. We couldn't get it working, but the premise of it is more or less what we want it to. So I recommend it for anyone who is annoyed by push notifications now. Um, maybe wait a week because I feel like it's buggy. The idea is cool, but while I was sitting there watching presentations, I got a notification that was almost two months old, or it said it was a new post, and I know it wasn't, it was my own post. But mm -hmm. It's buggy, but it seems cool. Yeah, yeah it's a cool idea. Were there any, in your guys' uh, research and everything, and uh, was there any unexpected uh, results or outcomes you guys received? Unexpected? Um, not, not really unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, I was a little bit surprised with pushover. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a cool idea. I was, I'm still not 100% sure what it does, but what I think it does is like compiles all of your information and then sends you like push notifications mm -hmm. with the things that you want. Yeah. Um, but I, it was unclear how it did compile those things. Okay. Um, so that was like kind of interesting. Um, and it also seemed like it was helping companies create push notifications too. So I was, yeah. Okay, so done with it.